week for last week here from the Aspen Magazine with another classic album review, or is it a reaction, or just opening a box of memories of how I discovered this particular album. I'd already discovered the band, but it was this album that took me down a rabbit hole to which I never really emerged from again. The band is Black Sabbath. The track is Black Sabbath, from the album Black Sabbath, inspired by the film Black Sabbath. It was 1973. I was 14, and my interest in music was exploding in that year. Um, the year before, 72, 71, I was captivated by the singles chart, Slade. T-Rex, Sweet, um, all sorts of different things. And then as I entered 73, I remember I'd, I'd listened to the rundown um, of the singles at the end of 72, Christmas, New Year's Eve, um, 73 I think it was, and they played Never Before by Deep Purple, who I'd heard of the name Purple because um, the big kids at school talked about these bands, Sabbath, Zeppelin, Purple. And so I thought that was interesting and then I, I talked to one of my mates who was into this kind of music and he said you need to listen to Sabbath really, um, as well as all these other bands. And I've talked about my introduction to Purple elsewhere, but I had a, f a friend at school, Paul, and um, his older brother had Paranoid by Black Sabbath. And I was just starting to think about learning to play the guitar. And I, I was aware of this terminology called bar chords. And when I listened to um, War Pigs, you know, you could hear the squeak on the strings as Tony Omi slid his fingers along the strings. I didn't realize at the time it had an injury and it was like these thin balls on the end of his fingers. But isn't it great anyway, I just point that out, that if that was today, some engineer would erase that sound. But in, back in those days, you could hear musicians fingers actually sliding across the metal against the wood of the instrument real real music being played by real people and so I thought you know with my my kind of meager pocket money I want to buy this album I, you know I thought it was you know there was Hand of Doom, Electric Funeral, Paranoid which they played at the school dinner discos um, you know, there was Iron Man, there was so much stuff, and I thought, you know, I, that's the album. I want Paranoid. And um, so I went down to Woolworths, down the Coventry Road where I lived, because um, I didn't have to catch a bus. Uh, Woolworths was a shop that sold everything from coat hangers to cat food to um, spare parts for your sink, and it had a record department. And Black Sabbath had their own little section. And they didn't have Paranoid. They had this. I had no idea what this was. Um, but it looked well scary. Um, because I, from the tracks I'd heard from Paranoid, they seemed like a band that sold, sold, sold. I'm still thinking about Woolworths. Um, they sang scary songs about scary things. And, and it was right up my street. You know, just getting into Hammer Horror and all that kind of stuff. Um, and there's no picture of the band, just this uh, woman on the front who I thought, well she, well, she must be a witch. Apparently she's holding a black cat, but I think that depends on the print version you've got because you can only barely make that out. But if she is, well, if she is carrying, holding a black cat, then that adds to my suspicions that she was, um, you know, a witch of some kind. And she's standing in front of some old mill kind of thing and it kind of like looked like Salem and all this kind of thing. So I thought, whoa. And on the inside cover, there was an upside down cross. Now I had no idea what that symbolized at the time. And I do know since then, of course, that the band had nothing to do with this. Um, and there was a poem, which talk that still falls the rain, the veils of darkness shroud the blackened trees which contorted by some unseen violence shed their tired leaves and bend their boughs towards a grey earth of severed bird wings amongst the grasses. Good God. 
poppies bleed before gestulating death and young rabbits born dead in traps. Stand motionless as though guarding the silence that surrounds and threatens to engulf all those that would listen. I'm listening. I'm listening. Mute birds, tired of repeating yesterday's terrors, huddled together in the recesses of dark corners. Heads turned from the dead, black swan that floats upturned in a small pool in the hollow. An upturned black swan. Here emerges from this pool a faint central mist that traces its way upwards to caress the chipped feet of a headless martyr statue whose only achievement was to die too soon and who couldn't wait to lose. God, this is heavy stuff, my young ears and mind. The cataract of darkness form fully and the long black nights begins yet still by the lake. A young girl waits, unseeing she believes herself unseen. She smiles faintly at the distant tolling bell and the still falling rain. It seemed totally apt and that young girl described there, is it her? Is it her on the front cover? of this mysterious Keefe designed cover. Keefe, of course, was the best person at tinting photographs in the known universe and did many album covers, but the tolling bell and the still falling rain. How else could the album start but exactly how those words had finished? So I came home with this, obviously I bought it. And mine is the What's on the WWA label, which I understand is probably rarer than the Vertigo label because it was a bit of a hybrid. It came with the Vertigo sleeve, but it was actually on WWA, um, which didn't mean anything to me. I just bought the first Black Sabbath album. That was the main thing to me, really. So I got home, mum and dad were out. So I was able to put this on. I didn't have a record player of my own, so I was downstairs and I placed it upon my dad's Dynatron Grundig, Grundig Music Center and sat down with the cover in front of me. And the album starts with a tolling bell and the soft falling rain and then thunder comes in and the atmosphere is there, just like a Hammer horror film. And then that riff appears. <laughs> A riff that defined a genre. A riff so heavy that it barely moves forwards. It's so heavy it seems to be playing to people that may be living beneath the floor, beneath the very ground of which you're standing or sitting on. A riff that's so heavy and discordant and kind of wrong in the way it is pitched together. And it's just so powerful and unlike anything I'd ever heard. It was, de it was, defining, was defining a genre with each note. In the music book, it describes it as slow tempo, 16 beats per minute. And then the riff pulls back and then that voice appears. That voice that is, of course, Ozzy, spelt O-S-S-I-E on the sleeve of this particular album. Jeez. When he starts to say, what is this that stands before me? Figure in black that points at me. Turn around quick and start to run. Find out you're the chosen one. And then the riff comes back in. It's just, it's like a Hammer horror film. But you supply the pictures. Your imagination just goes into overdrive. You can close your eyes and you can see it as this guy, because I didn't know, didn't have a relationship with Ozzy at this point, how it felt with music as you do with your, with your stuff, with the people that you admire. It was just a voice. But this guy was, was he in danger? Did I need to call for help? What the hell was going on? 
big black shape with eyes of fire telling people their desire satan's sitting there he's smiling watch those flames get higher and higher oh no 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 and the riff again please god help me this is the end my friend satan's coming around the bend as it races and gallops towards the end before tony army unleashes that guitar solo you can hear you can hear the fear the black shape the it was like the devil rides out by hammer horror it was in my parents house it was just incredible absolutely a track as i said at the start called black sabbath from the album black sabbath by black sabbath inspired by boris carlos film called black sabbath has that ever happened before I can only think of Bad Company from the album Bad Company by Bad Company. Was that inspired by a film called Bad Company? Let me know. Um, but otherwise, it's unique in that way that it, it is created in, in that way. But life was never going to be quite the same again for me or my parents. <laughs> And uh, we, we follow on with that, don't we? Well, we follow on with, um, you know, I've got also got the two CD version here with The Wizard. There were songs about wizards in these days. Yara Heap obviously sang about wizards, but this was before then. And this wizard had a tinkling bell. And the wizard, of course, has been used in um, Peaky Blinders to great effect uh, in one of the most recent series. But the wizard was a great track. Also the B-side Paranoid um, with some harmonica by Ozzy and great guitar solo, solo, solo in the middle. And it made you believe that wizards existed that they might be standing next to you in Woolworths when you buy albums like this who knows you'd only know by their tinkling bell probably and then after that we race we don't actually race we kind of stumble into behind the wall of sleep another horror driven lyric heavy visual of something that isn't quite right um but a a great track in itself and that acoustic guitar which i understand cost about 20 quid from what i read about a tony home interview many many years ago sounds great on here i don't think i think if you'd played a more expensive acoustic guitar it wouldn't have worked i don't think it worked but then we move into one of the greatest riffs of all time nib nativity in black or was it about nibs it was about bill ward's beard who knows um I, it was just known as NIB, but I, know, I just kind of accepted that. I didn't know what it meant, but the riff was one of the best riffs I'd heard. And at, at that age, um, riffs were everything. I was really into riffs for the next few years. I was, my, my musical tastes were defined by riffs, like Smoke on the Water, um, Heartbreak, a whole lot of love, NIB because it was a great riff with a great guitar trill at the end of it. But again, the lyrics were dark and scary for parents. Um, I think I have them somewhere in here. Because it's a love song in a way, but it has this, my name is Lucifer, please take my hand. Your love for me just got to, got to be real before you know the way I'm going to feel, I'm going to feel. So it was dark and moody and, the, the, do you know what? The other thing that's worth saying on this is Roger Bain's production. And for years, decades, bands have tried to emulate the sound of Black Sabbath. But what they don't perhaps get or do is the jazz. The jazz that exists in Sabbath's music, the swing Obviously there's blues, and that's the other thing to mention. As we as we moved out of the 70s and into the 80s and 90s, and heavy metal guitarists all went to Berkeley School of Shredding or whatever, and everybody had that sound. And um, even at my eldest son's local college, when he went to music college, they were teaching musicians how to do the tremolo on bomb and everything. Um, no one was teaching these four guys what to do. They didn't go to college to do this. They just did it. They went into a room. They did. They had no reference point. It's not like a band saying, oh, yeah, we're influenced by Black Sabbath or Judas Priest or whatever. No. They went into a room, 
and did this without, they weren't listening or looking over the fence at anybody. They picked up, and this could be Dave Gilmore, Tony Omi, or Brian May, or Richie Blackmore, or Tommy Bowling, Paul Kossoff, or Jimmy, anybody, any of these guitarists, they all had one thread in common. And for the guitarists, it took them back to the blues, to a blues scale, which they learned at probably, you know, some, you know, learn yourself guitar in how many weeks. But they all had that. They all had a thread, a plug into the blues. No matter how their music, as they went through their careers, morphed into something else, that was always there. You can hear that in a Tony Omi guitar solo from, you know, Sabbath Bloody Sabbath, just as much as you can from Dark Side of the Moon by Dave Gilmore. There's a thread, there is a connection, the blues, the feel, that's the word, the feel of what they imagine in their heads is then transformed through their fingers into the guitar and out to the amps, into the recording tape and into our homes. And for drummers and bass players, probably, it's jazz. Uh, Ian Pace uh, was another tremendous drummer influenced by the big band and the jazz drummers from the 50s and 60s. And Bill Ward was no different. And he's a butler, our Terence. Um, he's, he's bass sound. Um, he just, um, he was going to be the guitarist, he decided to do bass, but he, maybe that was why, but he, he's lead playing on the bass and the production of that bass guitar and the way it fits in with Bill Ward and the space, the sonic space, leaving room for Tony Omi to layer upon layer of demonic guitars but based in the blues and where else would the blues be based but in a demonic scale of some kind and of course this has that all and then Ozzy Osbourne's unique unique sound oh the days when vocalists could just make a noise that was their own whether you were Ozzy Osbourne, Robert Plant, Alice Cooper, um, Ian Hunter I'm just describing voices that are unique to the person that creates that sound. Whereas nowadays, all vocalists sound very similar in the way they do their inflections and delivery. But then, it didn't really matter if you couldn't quite do it. If you had the guts to stand up on stage and have a go, you were in. And Ozzy made a unique sound. And on these tracks, on this album, it was just perfect. It was perfect. I don't think Sabbath had anything to do with this cover, but my God, the, the people behind it was recording about, was it over a weekend for 800 quid or something? And here we are, all these decades later, and it still sounds absolutely unbeatable. Gosh, I've not even turned it over onto side two yet, have I? So on side two, we have Evil Woman, which is a commercial song, and it was a single. But again, it fits in, doesn't it? Evil Woman, Don't You Play Your Games With Me, kind of a lolloping um, boogie track, which was a cover. And then after that was um, Sleeping Village, which is, which is very kind of, a same kind of feel to Behind the Wall of Sleep. I always saw them as brother and sister tracks, those two. Um, I really did. And um, But they were both tracks that, as my kind of... Um, beginnings into the, having a go at playing the guitar, I could kind of play along with, so I was quite into it. But again, they were kind of horror-esque, Sleeping Village. It's a bit like, one of, again, one of these kind of um, Tales of Terror kind of films. And um, that's what it reminded me of. And then there was a massive track called Warning. It's a great, it's a cover version, but it goes off in many tangents, many, many tangents. And this is a song where Ozzy sings his love was just a little bit too strong. Or was the song just in the wrong key for his love to be too strong? Because when he sings that line, he barely makes it. In fact, you could say he doesn't. But that added to the disquiet, the unsettling feeling of the album that all around us at this time, everyone was aiming for perfection. And this album comes out with the vocalist doesn't quite get the words to fit in with the key. 
who would do that now? And I remember my dad listening to it, he did get that far, and thinking, what was that? They let that out. He couldn't, he can't sing it. It's, it's not in his key. I don't think it was. But they probably thought, it's all right, it'll do. But that song has the, that guitar bit that goes through like Tony Omi's Book of Riffs. You, you can almost imagine, he's not doing this, but you can also imagine he's kind of, he's going through them, he's made a few notes or go to the sea and then he does his stuff. Left-handed like me. And then he goes, oh, I've done that one. Uh, yeah, we'll go back a bit now. And it's all that picking. And then you can almost hear, uh, in my imagination I can, and if you turn it up loud enough so that your neighbours in the next road can hear it, you can almost hear Tony Omi put his foot on the distortion pedal at the end of one section as he comes in with boom, that down that like riff before it all comes ploughing in with Giz Butler's bubbling bass and we're back into that blues, so um, you know, drenched guitar playing and that rolling riff uh, as we head towards the end of the album um, and Ozzy's kind of last delivery of that line it's love been a little bit too strong absolutely fantastic this was um one of those albums that i carried around with me at school i didn't lend it to anyone <laughs> i pretended i was going to lend it to people i used to just carry it around under my arm so that the kids the big kids um would go cool album mate sabbath into sabbath yep cool album and I'd do that and then I'd carry it and then I'd take it back home at the end of school at the, and just take it to school and bring it back because I wanted people to know, look, I've, put, I've got a Black Sabbath album. I've got this. I know all about it. I didn't because that's all the only one I had. But um, they'd done others obviously by, you know, 1973 and I was going to have do some serious catching up. But there was one more track, wasn't there, that was not on the original album, but... You know, if the kids at school knew about it, it was like the Holy Grail and it was Wicked World, which is the B-side of Evil Woman, which eventually we could only get hold of via the um, We Sold Our Souls to Rock and Roll compilation, which came out a bit later. I could see why it didn't make the album, because it had a another solo guitar section by Tony Omi, and because there was already Warning and The Wizard, that would have made three, and it was probably too much. But... It had a killer riff, and a, a absolutely killer riff, and live they did this, and really extended the solo. And the lyrics were so observational about life. They are timeless. Geezer Butler's lyrics, I know some of it was obviously on this, was very kind of towards the Hammer Horror end of um, stuff, which decades later, death metal bands took to a different level altogether. But Wicked World's lyrics were very, very social commentary. And the lyrics on Paranoid um, were also social commentary and they're timeless. You know, just jumping forward to uh, Paranoid for a section, War Pigs. War Pigs is now, isn't it? You know, what's going on in the news now uh, in the world? War Pigs just works. You know, uh, War Pigs just works completely, doesn't it? So that was the missing track. The the other, the only, this version, um, I'm not going to do an unboxing on it, but this is the two CD deluxe version. And it's probably why there hasn't been a big box of this. There probably isn't anything left. Uh, because all that's on here is um, studio outtakes, uh, instrumental versions, um, are, are basically um, just instrumentals. It's only really the B-side. And it, it comes with a little booklet, um, which is how these looks editions used to be slightly wider with with the story of the story of the band sorry the band story of the album and a bit of about the band as well and it's you know it's definitely worth pursuing if you want to get it as regards to my version of this i just want to say this to any younger younger viewers as well and, and i'm going to uh, ask for some audience participation at the end of this video as well is that this the way you see a lot, especially on Discogs and eBay, people talk about, oh, it's the original pressing, or oh, it's this, or oh, you've got to get an original pressing. I don't subscribe to any of that because I just like my, what, to me, this is my original copy. 
It's the one I bought from Woolworths all those years ago. And this is the one that means the much to me. If someone said, oh, Phil, there's a vertigo pressing of Black Sabbath's film, you, it's X amount of money you will want it. I'm, I'm not interested. This is my original copy um, because it's the first one I bought. So it's the one I'm attached to the most. So it doesn't matter to me what it's pressed on. And that would be the same, you know, if you discover this album in 1978, it'd be on the probably green phonogram label, wouldn't it? Or whenever, or it'd be on NEMS, uh, I think, in the mid 70s, and then whatever it is now, the orange phonic, whatever it was, or, or splatter vinyl version, because that looks cool. I'm just saying that whatever you buy, whatever one that you connect to, that's the best. That's the best pressing for you. You don't need to go and spend tons of money. If you're happy with the one you've got, then you've got the best copy of that album in the world. That's that's it. It's yours. It's your copy. You can play it all the time. So that's Black Sabbath by Black Sabbath, featuring the song Black Sabbath. Has anyone ever seen the film Black Sabbath that inspired all of this? <laughs> I, I, I remember reading these books, they said that they used to, I think it was on in the cinema over the road when they were called Earth, and they thought, why don't we call ourselves Black Sabbath? And people, <laughs> when they started playing their set, people used to run away, <laughs> run away to the back of the room to get out, they scared, scaring, scaring their audiences. But what I would like to ask is, I've just described my journey to Black Sabbath and this album. What was yours? How did you find this album? And yes, I know there'll be some people of my vintage going, oh yes, you know, this is what happened to me. I'm, you know, um, I, I bought it or borrowed it from the school library or whatever. But I'm equally interested to anyone who's really young, you know, teenagers or people in their early 20s who found this, because I, I find it fascinating. I, I'm talking about what it was like when I bought this when I was a young kid. And I just as much love to hear about how people bought this when they were a young kid now because of how you discovered it amongst all the other stuff that's around there because because I you know the diff the difference is that if you're a young music fan now you've probably been exposed to so many different genres of music so many brand new bands and older bands all at the same time all in the same playlist when you go streaming to discover stuff and this pops up what does it feel like to to your younger ears when you can hear the whole history of this stuff in one go. Um, what do you think of the cover? You know, what do you, you know, the, the songs themselves, how does it gel? Did you listen to it as an album to start with, or did you just find a couple of tracks on a playlist and think, what's that? Um, that'd be just really interesting to know. But of course, for all of you music fans and Sabbath fans and, and whatever kind of fans you are, just let me know in the comments um, what you think and what you might like me to talk about in a future video that would be great and thank you very much for watching this and if you're new to the channel please subscribe and ring that notification bell become a patron and help support me to do even more of this stuff visit the now spinning magazine website where there's tons of content to explore and um, we have a private facebook community you can join with a monthly zoom catch up in a virtual pub called the now spinning arms but thank you to all my patrons especially yogi andy chris and clive and everyone else who's recently come on board stay safe keep spinning this music this music well any music your discs your vinyl and remember music is the healer and the doctor and i shall see you very very soon